I'm Mark Boris and this is Straight Talk. Everybody clap. Everybody sing. La, 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 la. Something that I was a part of has been a part of so many people's lives in hopefully a positive way. That blows me away. Hands in the air, rock a by your bed. Bear's now asleep. Shh, shh, shh. I think we're gonna end it there. Greg's not feeling real well. Tonight, the story to save the life of band member Greg Page. Collapsed on stage with a heart attack. It was at the end of a show and I felt exhausted and I collapsed. We always think that could never happen to me. Yeah. I never thought I'd have a heart attack, let alone one that nearly killed me. I guess it was that moment that I realised that I had to do something. Now the Yellow Wiggle has his own charity, Heart of the Nation. The point is this, when somebody drops in front of you, we need people to understand how to respond to that. You could save a life, it's so powerful. Greg Page, welcome to Straight Talk. Thank you, Mark. Good to be here. All the uh, younger staff in here have been uh, quite excited about this. <laughs> <laughs> really excited, particularly just our producer. Uh. <laughs> um, and uh, you're one of the Wiggles, one of the original founding Wiggles. So one of just, the old Wiggles. Uh, the old Wiggles, yes. <laughs> well, you're still a Wiggle. It's a bit like when you're president of the United States, you're always oh. a president of the United States. It never That's stops. an interesting way of looking at yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> so once a Wiggle, always a Wiggle. Um, I'm dying to know in the presence of uh, Australian royalty, um, how the hell did you become a Wiggle? Who came up with the idea of it? Where the bloody name come from? And uh, and the whole genius behind it. Okay, so really it was Anthony Field who was a member of the Cockroaches originally. Yep. Um, so, yeah, Anthony was studying teaching at um, university, preschool teaching uh, with Murray who was also ended up being in the Wiggles. Then I went to university with them because I was a fan of the Cockroaches. So I grew up in high school, listening to the music of the cockroaches. I thought, I love this music and I wanted to be a musician. So when I did work experience in high school, I reached out to their management and said, I want to be a roadie. I want to be a sound engineer. And I ended up doing my work experience for the cockroaches. So I got to know Anthony through that. And he said, well, look, you can't be a roadie all your life. You don't want to be lugging boxes upstairs when you're 50 years old. And now that I am 50 years old, he was certainly right. I don't <laughs> want to be doing it. He said, what else would you want to do? And I said, well, look, I look back on my time at school very fondly because I had teachers that came into the classroom with their guitars and they'd sing. And I thought if I can use music in education, I thought that'd be great. He said, well, you need to come to my campus, see what I'm studying, early childhood teaching. And you'll find that there's 500 girls and only six guys, so the odds are pretty good there. <laughs> um, so I did that. I went to his campus, had a bit of an orientation there, and the course sounded fantastic because early childhood teaching is all about freedom of expression through music and through art and learning through play as opposed to when you get into primary school, there's a lot of stencils that you have to fill out. Structure. There's a lot of structure to learning. And, you know, it is that way. But when you're in early childhood, it's all about just letting the child explore life and explore their environment. And that's how you learn. And I just love that concept. So really when I was in, it was the crossover between first year and second year, it was in the summer holidays. Anthony rang me and said, look, I want to um, get together and write some songs for kids and see what we can do with that. So we did that. We literally got together and wrote a bunch of songs. Yeah, and Murray. So Anthony, myself and Murray and um, uh, another guy who was in the group at the start, Philip Wilcher was his name. He was one of the music staff at the university. We, we all got together. We wrote some songs. We recorded them very shabbily um, on a four-track recorder back in the day and it kind of just grew from there and it was just Anthony's idea that he'd been listening to music for kids from all over the world, from Canada, from uh, America, from England and, of course, here in Australia we have this great institution called Play School. Yeah, I remember it. Incredible. It's yeah. been going for so many years on TV but the beauty of Play School is that it is so directly targeted at children. There's some uh, double entendre, not double entendres in a, a dirty sense but – there's adult content there for the parents and that's what makes it great co-viewing for parents to watch with their children. So it is kind of, well, we held it as a standard for us to aspire to with the Wiggles. So when you talk about, you know, how did it start, why did it work? It worked because we were educators, we were teachers, we loved music and we put that all together with this aspiration of being like play school for kids but with music. So it was the first time there was kind of a, a rock band for kids 
on the music scene in Australia. That's mad. So, yeah, so it's you actually went to um, early childhood teaching course, like yeah. at uni or yeah. something like Macquarie that, uni. Macquarie University. Yeah. Uh, but they were ahead of you. Yes, they were yeah, two years ahead of me. Two yeah. years ahead of you. Uh, but were they musicians as such? Yeah. Or so, were you? Yes. Yeah, so I'd grown up playing guitar and I'd played in high school bands and always wanted to be in a band. But I guess you look at life realistically sometimes you think, okay, how many musicians are there in the world? Yeah, yeah. What's the chances of becoming successful at it? So I thought, well, if I can't be on stage, I want to be behind the scenes. And that's where the idea of becoming a roadie or a sound engineer came to my mind. And I thought, well, I'd love to work in the music industry. But then it kind of took a turn when I met Anthony and ended up being in the Wiggles. But Anthony was in the Cockroaches, which were quite a well-known band throughout the late what, '80s, uh, we're going to say late '80s, so yeah. late '80s, yeah. Okay, yeah. so you're a Sydney boy, yep. Yeah, you were born and you grew up in Northmead, I think. Yeah, correct. yeah, on the northwest side of Sydney. Yeah. Have you ever looked back and gone, "Oh my God, I did an early childhood teaching course. I was going to be a teacher. Um, I always aspired. I loved singing, but I was never really going to get in a band that may be super <laughs> successful." Do you ever think to yourself, "What oh, my God, how that turned into the Wiggles?" Oh, all the time. Yeah, like yeah. each stage of it. Yeah, well, that's the thing, right? It didn't just kind of go bang, the Wiggles were on the scene and we were huge. It yeah. took years. And so each step along the way, you'd achieve something that you thought was not going to be possible and you'd sort of look around and go, wow, this is great. You know, we've, we've got a record deal with the ABC. Then, wow, we're doing live shows now. Wow, we're actually getting paid to do live shows. You know, yeah. we, we used to do parties for three hundred bucks. Um, then we sold tickets to our shows, and that was so. Each little incremental step along the way to that success that we had at the peak in probably two thousand and four. Um, each step, we'd just kind of look at and go, "Wow, we never thought this would happen." So, yeah, to, so look, to look back now in retrospect is even more mind blowing. It's pretty amazing because uh, your model or well, your aspiration was to do play school or to be like play school. Yeah, in, in that you may use fun for little kids, um, and I remember my kids watching play school, but I and they were all born in the eighties, and uh, uh, you you use that as a model that you aspired to. Of course, you guys went on to far out outstrip anything play school ever did. Mind you, play school was very successful, yep. was, and wasn't your model, different style of model. Yep. I'm dying to know who decided to dress you up the way you guys got dressed up. <laughs> what, what was that process? How does that work? Like, and when did it come into the formula? Did you start off that way? Like when you used to do parties for 300 bucks a, a party? When, how did it kick off? So to the clothing, the costumes. Yeah, right? yeah, costumes, so yeah. our very first album, we had a different look. And it was terrible. It was like just black pants with a multicolored shirt. So whatever multicolored shirt we could find, just something that was bright, you know, supposedly visually attractive. But if you look at the album cover, it's not visually attractive. And that's why we changed our look for the second album that we did. And the reason uh, why we came up with the new look was because Anthony had said, just go black pants and a solid color on top. We'll all have a different solid color on top. Instead and, of an Hawaiian shirt. Yeah, instead of an awful, yeah, gaudy, horrible looking shirt. So and um, Jeff already had a purple kind of skivvy at home. Murray already had a red one. So it was kind of set from that point that the, Jeff would be purple, Murray would be red. Then Anthony and I went shopping together to try to find something because the photo shoot was the next day. Skivvies. S well, skivvies, yeah. We said skivvies. We'll go with skivvies. That was a bit of an 80s, 90s thing. Yeah, it was a bit, a little bit retro even at that point, I must say. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, we walked into Grace Brothers, the old Grace Brothers yeah, over yeah. at Chatswood. We walked into the menswear department and on the back wall was a blue skivvy hanging up and we both saw it. And I, I, blue's my favourite colour. So we both ran for the blue skivvy and Anthony got there first. So he, he's a quicker <laughs> runner than me. So Anthony got blue. Next to that was a yellow skivvy. And um, I, I just took that one. And it wasn't actually until a few years later, one of my old friends from school, he said to me, oh, it's kind of funny you end up with a yellow skivvy, isn't it? I said, why is that? He said, oh, duh, like our school uniform was a yellow skivvy. And I had totally oh, forgotten wow. that. Like our winter uniform right through primary school was a yellow skivvy. So I went back to my school photos. There I am wearing a yellow skivvy every year. <laughs> so it's kind of kind of cool that I ended up in the yellow. How did Anthony know that the uh, the colour shirts, but not the, the solid colours, but the, the pride of that, how did he know it didn't work? Like, well, what, would you get feedback or something off the yeah, album? Yeah, look, I think we, we probably did get a bit of feedback, but we just looked at it and went, yeah, it just doesn't look good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think then by that stage we'd been at it for about a year and in Anthony's um, wisdom he kind of looked at it and went, you know what, I think we can do better. I think we can do something that's a stronger visual thing. So let's go with 
black pants and a solid color on top and that just stuck then after that because it became a way that kids could identify each wiggle so like i became the yellow one yep. murray was red and it just stayed that way and it's it's a very cool idea yeah it, very simple but it turned out to be very cool yeah, i mean i guess you probably didn't realize the, the impact it was going to have at the time in terms of the colors but yeah. kids are simple aren't they i mean i, I don't know you're a, you're an early childhood teacher you know more about kids behavior and the psychology of kids I, I i just i raise four kids so i got that's all i know well you you'd be quite qualified to comment too i think yeah but only <laughs> but only a sample of four but you but you're still you're you're performed in front of and have feedback from thousands and thousands and probably hundreds of thousands of kids over the years um so you you know you you're a dead set expert in it but it's interesting how simple kids are and the assumption that um, kids are more complex than they really are is probably a bad assumption. Uh, so, and we're talking about kids under what age now? Well, so early childhood. At the time. Yeah, so at the time we were kind of targeting kids. Well, we ended up appealing to kids from the age of 18 months through to, you know, six years. But we were really targeting two or three years old, you know, that, that kind of age group. Um yeah, kids are fascinating because kids are so um, innocent. I was yeah. going to say naive, but that that's that could be deemed derogatory. They're not naive. They're just innocent. They're, they haven't been exposed to the things that adults have been exposed to. So when you're wanting to communicate with kids, you've just got to strip things right back and yeah. try and think a lot, as you say, more simply. You know, they're, they're, they're not complex, but I guess this is the point. At that time in their life, in early childhood, that is when they are exposed to the world and they're like sponges. They soak up everything around them, things they hear, interactions they have with people, things they observe, and it becomes part of their psyche or part of who they are as an adult. And so, you know, they say, show me the man at 30 and I'll show you the man at three or show, the, show me the man at three, I'll show you the man at 30 because we don't actually change that much throughout life. We absorb things and we grow and develop, but it's so much based on who we were at that point of time in our life at three years old. When you, and maybe you can tell me this if you don't mind, Anthony obviously was a, a bit of a driver in the business, yeah. uh, like in a strategic sense. Yep. But w what about choreograph? Like, uh, you know, in terms of the jumping around that you guys did, <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, and, and, and the role playing that each yeah. one of you had you know, different roles. Um, who works all that stuff out? Like, uh, or was that a, a, you know, collaborative thing amongst all of you? It was something that changed over time. So it began as just the four of us. We, you know, we were literally just a band. You know, that's all our experience was, just being in bands. So we had no idea of it being a show or, yeah. an, or a, a, a more complex entertainment experience. It was just, hey, we'll get up and we'll play some songs. And it just developed over time into something more theatrical. I mean, to the point theatrical where... Theatrical is a good word. Theatrical is a good word yep. um, because it did become a lot more theatrical over the years. So we did bring on a choreographer um, around about 1996, I think it was, so about four years after we'd started. You know, we kind of got to the point where we were thinking, okay, well, yeah, we were just coming up with dance moves. A lot of our songs kind of suggested what the choreography might be. So, for instance, we had this song called Rockabye Your Bear and it's very simple. It's everybody clap. Everybody sing, la, 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 bow to your partner. Then you turn around, hands in the air, rock a by your bear, bear's now asleep. Shh, shh, shh. So the choreography is dictated by the lyrics. Yes. A lot of our songs were kind of like that where you could draw the choreography from what we wanted the kids to be doing to marry it with the lyrics. But then it kind of got to the point where after doing four or five albums, the songs got a little bit less like that and a bit more story-based or character-based. So to go back to your question about how do we determine the role playing in the group, the four Wiggle characters were very much just based on who we were. Right. So, yeah, one of my traits in the group was that I was a magician. I love magic as a in kid. Real, in real. I, I love it, yeah. I yeah, love so magic. I love magic. Oh my yeah, God, I, love magic. I love magic. So that became one of the things that I did in the group. Um, uh, Anthony, <laughs> one of Anthony's traits is that he, he loved eating and that kind of also came from real life. Like um, one of Anthony's nicknames that we have for him was Sumo and that came about because back in the early days of touring here in Australia, we'd be away you know, for four weeks at a time and, you know, we'd go to RSL clubs for dinner and it wasn't uncommon in the early days 
that Anthony would have two meals, like literally. He'd eat the buffet out. <laughs> he'd, he'd have one meal and he'd go and order another one and he'd say, man, you eat a lot of food. And he said, yeah, I'm like one of those sumo wrestlers. You know, the sumos eat a lot of food. And so his nickname became sumo because he was like a sumo wrestler. Um, so that's where his trait of eating food came in the wiggles and Jeff being sleepy, well, I don't know where that actually came from, to be honest, probably – Oh, I do know where it came from. It's not tied to who he is, but Murray loves playing guitar. That was his trade in the Wiggles. So it did come from a lot of our, our own personal um, things that we enjoy doing. When you're putting a song together, are you tactically trying to appeal to the parents, to, for example, to tell kids it's time to go to bed? The, the thinking was appeal to the kids. Yep. Yeah, appeal to the kids but deliver content or messages that we know are good messages like yep. through what we understand about teaching. And so everything we did was always based on our knowledge of early childhood um, psychology but also classroom management strategy. So in our live shows we'd always go back to how we learn how to manage children in a group situation which sounds kind of silly, but it's true. I mean, you've just got to manage kids properly in a classroom or else you have chaos <laughs> because yeah. kids can be so um, spontaneous. So you've got to manage them and we do the same thing in live shows and a very simple way of doing that but also to appeal to parents was we didn't say, hi, boys and girls, how are you all? We'd say, hi, everyone. Hi, everyone, great to see you. And automatically we're including the parents because they're yeah. part of that audience. And so that's just such a simple thing to do, but it's to do with language and how you t talk to people that makes them feel like they're a part of what's going on. So whilst we didn't um, strategically target parents, we strategically included them. That's obviously brilliant because it was ex extraordinarily successful and, 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 you know, obviously if, I want to congratulate you and everybody as to how you put it together and I'm sure it's not just the four of you now. There's mm. a big, big, big team in those days and, and even today I guess. But as a, as a business especially, but getting to kids is – sometimes could be a bit challenging because I, I, I imagine you would have said, I'd say, are we manipulating the kids into something or and nothing bad? But I'm <laughs> yeah, just yeah. saying, are we dragging them along sort of uh, the way we want them to go? And if so, you know, you're quite powerful in that regard. What are your obligations? Did you often have to sit, sit down and have ethical conversations with, your, with each other? Look, I, I don't know that we had to have too many ethical conversations. I think we had a couple of ethical conversations and – Certainly they came up more so in the context of merchandise. Right. Right. So I remember one conversation about a fast food company that wanted to sponsor the Wiggles and we just thought, look, it's not really in line with promoting healthy eating, so we had to say no to that. The other one that I can remember was in terms of consumer products, so products that we'd sell with our logo or name on them. Merch. Like merch, 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 that's right. Um, so in terms of merch, um, it's funny, like we used to call it merch back in the day but – we didn't kind of think people knew what that term was, but now everybody has merch. So, yeah, yeah. yeah so merch, consumer products. Um, somebody wanted to put our images. So our, so we had cartoon characters developed of each of our Wiggles characters. Somebody wanted to put those on kids' underwear and we just thought, no, nah, that's not nah. right. You know, you yeah. can't have our, our images on kids' underwear. That's not right. So those kinds of things you would have to be very careful about because the way you are perceived is very important and if you – you know, if you didn't think those things through, you just go, yeah, no problem. And quite innocently, you could do that. You could just go, it's it's just our picture on kids' underwear. But other people might perceive that a different way. Particularly so, at a different time. Like, yeah. you know, you can, because, you know, there's no, there's no uh, secret about the fact that we today judge what happened 20 years ago by today's, by today's standards. standards. Yep. That happens all the time. Absolutely. And that can actually bring a brand down quite, quite quickly. Yeah. And it seems to be a bit of a, um, a pastime for, for some to do that. I mean, it's a bit unfortunate, but it's just the way things are. It is yeah. the way things are. And you've got to think for the future. So, yeah, but you can't predict what you, pe you, people's values and, and judgments are going to be. In therefore, you've got to be really time. conservative. Well, you've got to try to be, I guess. You've got to try to – I think at the time we were just trying to base what we did – on what we'd learned about children and how they think and what appeals to them and what was known at the time and what we knew at the time too as uh, three males that had gone through university. We knew that 
we could never be above our suspicion. You know, you couldn't go into a change, a, a, a nappy change room on your own as a male and change a, a baby's nappy. You had to bring a female with you. So you, you couldn't do those kinds of things. You had to be very careful. In those days? In those, so that's 30 years ago, yes. We, we were told in, in university, you know, you cannot be left alone in, a, in that kind of situation with a child. You've got to be always there with somebody else. Even if it's your own child? Well, probably not if it's your own child, but certainly in a childcare centre or, yeah. you know, if you're looking after kids, you know, you can't take them to the bathroom on your own. You've got to be very mindful of the fact that you're not above reproach. You're obviously an entertainer, you know, you're creating theatre, which obviously you love, it's so cool, it's fun, but that's sort of on the surface and we just talked in that about sometimes having to consider the ethics. But what do you really see yourself as? What, what was the real role of your organisation well, I think we were trying to deliver educational content to children in a way that they could play at home. So getting kids up and dancing, getting them moving, getting them connecting things that they see as part of the Wiggles with what they experience in life. So it's being that conduit between the TV and life so that we're showing them things that, you know, happen in real life, connecting them to songs that they always remember. So... <laughs> You know, it's crazy today, you know, Jess, your producer will probably know fruit salad, yummy, yummy. It's, so when you talk about were we manipulating kids, many people have said, were you brainwashing kids like, you know, fruit salad, yummy, yummy? Well, I guess we kind of were, we, but we weren't doing it. For purposely. Any, well, not purposely, but I guess we didn't know how much these songs were going to stick around in their heads for years to come. And so now as the original Wiggles, when we do shows for – kids that are probably Jess's age and they're, gosh, they're getting into their late 20s now, some of these kids. We do shows for them. They come along and we play to 10,000 people all singing Fruit Salad Yummy Yummy because it takes them back to those days of being four or five years old, three years old, and they remember those times in their life. And that's so powerful to connect to that, that time in your life when you had no cares in the world and, you know, the wiggles were something to listen to. And it's just so joyous when you're in a room full of 10,000 people singing fruit salad, yummy, yummy. There's not a care in the world. Yeah, and it's quite – nostalgia is quite a powerful thing too. Mm -hmm. It's a very powerful thing. It's actually – it must spike something in the brain that sort of to drop a whole lot of dopamine or serotonin or something through the reward system to them that has last, last with them, you know, if they were three at the time, now they're 26, has last with them for 23 years. It's yeah, very powerful. But I think that can be um, the case with so many things that as an adult, you'll smell something, you'll see something, you'll hear something that takes you back to another time in your life. And when it takes you back to that childhood experience, for, for a lot of people, hopefully it's a really positive childhood. And we did have somebody come up to, to us at one of our shows recently who didn't have a good childhood, had a terrible childhood. But she said to us, she said, thank you so much for what you did because it gave me something to escape to. Some outside. relief. Yeah. And look, that's just so awful. And that's, that's probably the case for some, some kids, of course, that they don't have a really positive childhood. But if the Wiggles could have brought them some positivity in that terrible time, if they can then go back to that now through reconnecting to the Wiggles in their adulthood, hopefully they can bring them some of that feeling that they can then harness now as an adult and use that in a positive way to move forward. Listening to you, it, it's always been a fantastic experience for you in your life. Oh, like, incredible. Like, like I, I, can't, I can't explain. Like blessed. Absolutely blessed, yeah. Like, I mean to have gone from wanting to be a musician to thinking that it will probably never happen but still wanting to be in the music industry and then have that experience. It wasn't planned. So a lot of people also think, gee, it was a great idea you guys had. Well, it was a great idea. But the idea was never a plan. The only plan was to create content for kids that was going to be developmentally appropriate, which means it was directly appropriate for a three-year-old or a four-year-old. It wasn't, it wasn't targeted at adults and talking down to children. It was at their level. That was our only goal. And because we hit that goal, it became what it became. And the journey was just so wild. It was incredible to think we played Madison Square Garden in the US and we played so many venues around countries that we'd never dreamed that we would play in. It just blows me away. If you look back on your career in entertaining kids with educational content and being incredibly successful as a group, 
What other things do you think this gave you that you would never uh, that that the kid from Northmead would never have ever got in his life? Oh, look, I don't know. I don't. Uh, I guess so many things, but I don't really sort of quantify them or uh, assess them. Like friendships. Oh, look, definitely friendships. I mean, the uh, there's so many things. I mean, I can't imagine if someone like you. I mean, if it was me, I would be. I would lay in bed in the mornings when I wake up, think, you know, you know you've been through some health issues, and mm. a, I'm alive. Yeah, that's great. And I don't. I'm not trying to be morbid. You wake up, and you, I'm alive. I'm good. Yep. And then you think, wow, my life. I mean, we talk about it being a blessing, but what what did I get out of all this stuff? I mean, I've got great friendships. Um, you know, so what you recognise everywhere else, but you've travelled. You've done things that the kid from Northmead who used to wear the welly, yellow uniform in the in the yeah. winter may never have had unless he crossed paths with these individuals. Yeah, and, did, and you went and did what you did. Uh, look, I guess in a spiritual kind yeah, of way. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I, I'm kind of connected to the fact that something that I was a part of has been a part of so many people's lives in hopefully a positive way. To me, that's like the biggest blessing you can have. The fact that without setting out to do it, we had a connection with so many people who are now in their 20s but still are so connected to the Wiggles and have such fond memories of it. That blows me away, right? It's not like, um, I don't know, like you can't dream that from from a young age. You can say, well, I want to make music and I want to be a musician and you can say, okay, well, I did that. And I'm grateful for that. I'm so grateful for that. But for the fact that it actually went further than that, it wasn't just making music. You didn't sell just a million albums like a, a good musician might, which you know, you, uh, you've well, actually changed. You, you, you've changed some people's lives, and you've had a yeah. massive effect, which has lasted as on the example we just gave for 23, 24 years to some of these individuals, and in a positive way. Po- very positive. Like, it's funny. Like you talk about selling albums, I, I wouldn't know how many we've sold because I don't try. I don't measure things in that way. Um, yeah, I just honestly think how blessed I am to have had those experiences with the guys, of course, and the the friendships and the fun that we had. And when we get together now and do these shows, it's like getting on a bike again. The, the, the camaraderie that we have, it's just so well embedded in our relationship that we can, you know, you know, sledge each other and do all that kind of stuff that we did 30 years ago. And it's just, yeah, that kind of deep-rooted friendship. So I'm very grateful for that. But I think the overarching thing for me is just to put my head on the pillow at night and know that what we did far exceeded anything that we set out to do. But to know that we've had, as I say, hopefully a positive impact on all these kids, the number of people that say, you know, I went into music because of you. I learned guitar because of the Wiggles, those kinds of things. I ate my fruit salad because of the Wiggles. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I'm now fit and healthy because I listened to those uh, healthy messaging songs that you wrote. So I just find it blowing me away. I mean, it's, to me it's absolutely amazing. Um, I mean some people, some of us bat ourselves on the back because we might have done a few things but the impact you've had on globally, <laughs> not just not just here in Sydney or Australia but it's a global impact, it's Bloody amazing! It's really amazing, and it's still going. So yeah, today the Wiggles has a different um, makeup. Line up, yep. Um, how does that? How do you view that? So just as I guess, is, is it just a response to social change? Yeah. So a few years back now, maybe two years or so ago, the Anthony came up with this idea of having the fruit salad TV Wiggles. You know, we're all fruit salad. We're all different. Uh, so it's like a bowl of fruit salad. There's people from all different cultures. So. Um, there's now eight Wiggles, I guess. So there were four originally. Um, there's eight Wiggles now that represent all different backgrounds, which is, I think Anthony said, when they released that on YouTube, it was their biggest content, like in terms of views, like it just went berserk. So it shows that there is definitely a market for that. And yeah, that's responding to, to social times. But it's also a reflection on the fact that had we done this from the start as a business, the Wiggles back then wouldn't have been the Wiggles. We would have gone, right, well, hang on. We've got Jeff who's, you know, Chinese background, Chinese-Australian background. Then we've got um, Murray, Jeff, uh, Murray, Anthony and Greg, all sort of white Caucasian males. 
no women. Yeah. <laughs> we should have had a female in the group, right? It wasn't put together for the purpose of being a commercial thing. It was just four mates getting together and making music. So yes, the fruit salad TV wiggles is a reflection on the fact that times have changed to the point where, you know, it was no longer good enough to sort of say, well, it just happened because we were four blokes, four, four males who got together and we were friends. It needed to reflect the current times and and be socially responsible in that way. Can you tell me about the impact on your health of being a wiggle? Yeah, it was hard physically. We did. What does it mean though? Like road, on the road yeah. all the time? What is it? Well, in the early days here in Australia, we were kind of on the road for about 10 months a year. And when I say on the road, we would do like four-week tours at a time and we'd be away for four weeks at a time. Family come with you or just on your own? Uh, back in the early days, Murray was married. Um, so in the early early days, then later on Anthony and I got married also. But by that stage the touring had changed a little bit. So in the early days we'd be away four weeks at a time. Then we'd come back home for maybe a week or two, then we'd go away again. Then that got too much. So we had to do – kind of a week at a time and then we'd come back on weekends to see the families and things like that. Then when we started touring the US, that was, you know, five weeks at a time, three times a year, but we'd also be doing Australian tours, New Zealand tours, UK. It was a lot of touring. The hardest touring, well, I'll just go back to Australia for a second. When we toured in Australia, we'd do three shows a day. So we'd do a 10 o'clock show, an 11.30 show, then a one o'clock show. Some days we'd do a fourth show at 2.30. And the show, if anybody's seen a wiggle show, they know there's a lot of jumping around. And, yeah. yeah. It was hard physically on the body, like the knees and the feet. So that was physically hard. By the time we started touring America, the American shows were different. So we'd do two shows a day in the US. They were longer shows. They were like an hour and 20 minutes. So in Australia, it would be a 50-minute show. So four 50-minute shows a day or three 50-minute shows. The US was two one hour, 20 minute shows, and they'd be a 3 p.m. show, then a 7 p.m. show. And then after those shows, we'd travel overnight on a bus. And that's the bit that I found the hardest because I couldn't sleep on the bus. It was just so hard to sleep and get that rest that you needed to get up and do the same thing again the next day. And that's what really took a toll on me, I think. Um, and also not knowing that I had this weird condition called orthostatic intolerance, which was probably caused by the fact that I don't retain fluid very well. So all that sweat that I was putting out during wiggle shows and all the drink that I would drink, like Gatorade and water, I wasn't retaining that fluid that I was putting back into my body. So I became very dehydrated, which resulted in my blood becoming very thin, which then results in low blood pressure, particularly when you stand up. So I started collapsing. I would faint when I stood up. In the up. show? Not in the show, backstage. Right. So when – the funny thing with this condition is when you're moving around, you're fine. It's when you stop moving that the blood pools in your legs and you feel faint and giddy and collapse, yeah. And so that orthostatic intolerance, intolerance, um, which basically means you can't retain water. Well, no, it means you can't remain static in an upright position. Right. But it was caused by the fact that my body wasn't retaining but, the water. But then later on... You had a heart attack later on. Later on. So, yeah, yeah. That, that was early in the days. That's why I left the Wiggles in 2006 because of that condition. It was debilitating. Yeah, didn't, didn't know what was wrong. And at that time I actually had my heart thoroughly investigated and the doctors all sort of said, yeah, that's pretty good. Because that would be the first place to go. If, if right. you're feeling they're going to say, you've got a heart problem yeah, potentially. that's right. So they did all the stress, stress tests. Stress tests, and the, yeah. You know, like they put you – did they do the um, uh, calcium – Scores no, not the of, calcium score, but like an angiogram. Or oh, no, oh, you yeah. went the next step. Yeah. Okay, an angiogram. Yeah, so Make sure there's no blockages yeah. and the, the valves are all working and yeah. you got the tick of approval. Yeah, yeah. All, all good. So, But then what caused the heart attack? So that was in 2006 that I left. Yep. And look, my diet hasn't been all fruit salad, yummy, yummy. It's been yeah. a lot of meat and potatoes and not, not very – Also travelling on the road. Yeah, it's not great, you yeah. know. And so particularly then because of the orthostatic intolerance and feeling lethargic – I would tend to eat a lot to try to get the energy to do the yeah. shows. So I did put on quite a bit of weight in that time. Um, so my cholesterol did go up. So around about 2007, 2008, uh, maybe, no, that would have been later. might have been 2010. My cholesterol was 6.6. .6, wow. So I had to get that down. And I did. I got it down. And um, But at that point in time, because I'd had all the tests previously and I thought my heart was good, 
I didn't bother doing any other tests because my blood pressure was fine, no family history, no diabetes, none of the other risk factors. And having got the cholesterol down, I didn't know there was any issue. And then, so literally, yes, as you say, I had a massive heart attack on stage at the end of one of the original Wiggle shows in 2020. The heart attack was so massive, though, that it sent me straight into cardiac arrest. And, yeah, it, it, heart attack and cardiac arrest are two different things. It was on and, stage? Yeah, right at the end of a show. And, and what happened? Well, I just went down. I didn't know what was going on. I had no symptoms. I just was at the end of a show and I felt exhausted and I collapsed. I remember seeing it on the news. I remember it yeah, was. and uh, luckily for me, there were people around me who knew what to do. So what did they do? What did they do? Well, they assessed me. Yep. They checked was I okay? So, so these are first aid people or something like that? Well, these were just – so the first person to come to my aid was a, a GP in the audience who was there with her daughters that night to watch the show. Wow. And one of her daughters saw me collapse and said, Mum, Greg's collapsed. Remember he's got that issue. Maybe you should go and check that he's okay. Now, when she said that issue, she was talking about that orthostatic mm -hmm. intolerance that I had. So Therese was the GP's name. She came up onto the stage, made her way over to me and assessed me, realised that I wasn't responding. Now, when I say not responding – they couldn't get me to wake up, so couldn't get me to answer any questions, couldn't get me to squeeze her hands. That's not a good sign. That's when you've got to call triple zero. So they called triple zero. Then they realised that I wasn't breathing. Now, when somebody's not responding and not breathing, you've got to start CPR because if you don't, that person will die within minutes. So luckily, they started CPR. So Therese together with a lady by the name of Kim Antonelli, who was working for the Wiggles that night. She'd done first aid as well, so she came in and helped Therese start the CPR. Then whilst this was going on, the other three Wiggles were doing an encore of Hot Potato. So there's recess going on backstage for me and they're out doing Hot Potato. Show must go on. The show must go on. The drummer for our band that night, Steve Pace, he was also first aid trained. He saw what was going on with me and he thought, Geez, I've got to help this guy. So he got up, finished hot potato, <laughs> got up and then came over and started doing CPR as well. Um, by that stage, another member of the audience, Grace Jones, who's a nurse, she came up to help and luckily somebody, one of the security guards at the RSL club, brought a defib in and uh, they were able to use it to shock me and resuscitate me. Defib in your defibrillator. Defibrillator, a, a Portable yeah. defibrillator. AED. Defibrillator. Yep. An AED, of which I was saying earlier that when, before the show started that I have a couple of these in various places in my in my life because Guy Leach introduced me to him many, many years ago on a, on a podcast actually, but uh, one of our podcasts. And when you tell me about the defib, I mean like I've never known, I don't even know how to use it. I mean yep. I, I often sit and think, well, what, what happened if I have to use this? Yeah. You were just telling me earlier that these things are structured through the process. Yeah, you don't have to be trained in how to use one. You don't even have to know how to use just one. Just have one. Just have it there, right? That's the first thing. And that's the problem a lot of people don't understand that it's great to have it, but you've got to know that you don't need to be trained to use it. In fact, it's just got that power button there that you can hit that and it'll start Press talking it. to you, yeah. Training scenario. It's probably pretty loud. Two. That's all right. Adult patient. Call for medical assistance. So if you haven't called triple zero, call them straight remove away. Remove clothing from patient's chest to expose bare skin. Pull green tab to remove pads. So I've already removed yep. the pads because I was showing you before, but they're the pads that you place Heal on the, pads on from the skin. Liner. And the pads show you where to place them on the oh, patient. Wow. pads right. to patient's bare chest, as it's shown a, in picture. Right, it's so clear. Press right? pads firmly to patient's bare skin. So once you've got the pads on the patient, it will assess the heart rhythm. So I'll just stop that there, but yep. it'll keep talking you through what to do. This device does everything. You've just got to help it do what it needs to do. So it will assess the heart rhythm and whether or not the patient needs to be shocked. So you can't shock somebody and hurt them right? This does all the decision making. If the patient needs to be shocked, there's two types of models. There's automatic and semi-automatic. The automatic one will just say, um, patient needs a shock, stand clear, and it will send the shock. If it's semi-automatic, it'll say, stand clear, press the orange shock button or whatever shock button it is on that type of model. But no matter what type of AED it is, they're all pretty similar in the sense that you just need to turn it on, listen to the instructions, Follow the instructions. It'll do all the work and you could save a life. It's so powerful. Where does the Heart of, Heart of a Nation uh, charity fit into all this? Yeah, so Heart of the Nation is a charity that I started up about three or four months after I survived and I realised that there needs to be greater awareness in the community about AEDs and the role of CPR. 
Because when I got out of hospital, I realised there's a lot of AEDs in the community that I'd never seen. Yeah. One of the reasons I identified as to why I've never seen them is because they look like a first aid cabinet. They're just a white cabinet on the yeah, wall I got one. with a green and white sticker yeah, on it, right? Yeah, and a little light keeps flashing on yeah, and off. Yeah, that's right. And I'd just walk past them and think, well, that's just a first aid cabinet. I had no idea what an AED was. So then I thought we've got to try to make them more visible in the community. We've got to let people know where they are. So Heart of the Nation began as an initiative whereby if you've got an AED at your workplace, register it with us, let us know, yep. and we'll send you out a bright yellow sticker. And this is where yellow comes back to the story, right? A bright yellow sticker to put on the front door or window of your business so that people coming in and out or walking past get to know that there's an AED at that location. Because if somebody goes into cardiac arrest just around the corner or down the street, if they don't know you've got an AED, they can't use it and they can't save a life. How do you get the jello sticker though, Luke? Yeah, so you you log onto our webpage, heartofthenation.com.au, yep. and there's a, a place there where you can sign up and register your AEDs with us. Right. Once you register, we'll send you out the sticker. You stick it on the front door or window of your business and let people know that you've got it there and let them know that if they need to use it, that they can. How about if someone wants to buy an AED, they don't have one, so what do you guys recommend? Yeah, so look, we can help you there with that as well. We do sell AEDs and the base model one is, you know, one that looks like this. There's a couple of models that look like this. They're made by HeartSign. They're probably the ones that we recommend the most. Yep. They're not the only ones we sell. We do sell other ones, but um, yeah, it's a good place to start with that one. So look, if you do want help with buying an AED, uh, you can log onto the website and get in touch with us and we'll guide you through through that process. We'll show you the different options and let you know the different features. And and Heart of a Nation has been going for how long now? Almost three years. Almost three years. And, and, yeah. and are you, do you feel as though you're getting the message through? I mean, this is yeah. a great forum to do it. I mean, these yeah. are the sorts of forums you need to, I guess you need to go to. Yeah. And I'm very happy for, to, you know, to accommodate that. I mean, apart from the fact I, I get to hear a great story and meet one of the Wiggles, like it's, <laughs> which is amazing. But um, and you're using your position of yeah. fame, so to speak. Profile, I call it. Profile, yeah, I guess, yeah. yeah. Profile yeah. Yeah. to do a good thing. Um, that's there's not enough that happens in our, in, in, in this country at least. Um, you don't have any issue with doing that? Does it open doors for you to find? Yeah, and look, when I survived, when I woke up in hospital and I saw my cardiac arrest on the TV, on the news, I think that was the moment I realised that you I... You saw yourself, you saw the fall. And yeah, it, and that really, you know, it was very bizarre, but I guess it was that moment that I realised that I had to do something because because I could get on the news. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. not like, it's not about ego. It's not about saying, no. look at me, look at me. It's about saying, that happened to me. You saw it on the news. It could be you. That could be you. And the fact is that 27,000 Australians every year suffer a cardiac arrest out of hospital and only 10% survive. 90% don't survive. And we can change that. We can change it with greater awareness about how to identify someone in cardiac arrest, um, that we need to call triple zero, start CPR and have an AED. And you know what? Only 2% of cases of cardiac arrest get an AED used on them before the ambulance arrives. 2%. And what's interesting about that too is maybe what we need to do is all all of us need to start to take notice where the AED machine might be. Correct. Because most of us don't look out for these sorts of things. We're, we're not, it's not part of our psyche. Yeah. It's not part of, right? We always think that could never happen to me. Yeah. That was me. I never thought I'd have a heart attack, let alone one that nearly killed me, right? One that sent me into cardiac arrest. My wife's a cardiac nurse. Wow. Yeah. And she would always say to me, don't have so much butter on your bread. Don't have so much butter on your toast. Don't eat the chicken skin. Don't have so many sausages. I thought I was okay because I could exercise without any of the symptoms or warning signs that they talk about. So I was playing competition cricket, competition tennis. I was walking seven and a half Ks in an hour every day. No problems, right? But I dropped dead. And it could be anyone out there in the community. We need to have this on our radar because it's happening. Not every day, everywhere you happen to be. But every day there's about 80 people that drop dead and need to be resuscitated. And I, I guess I'm going to finish off with something that I find re really curious but and I'm a great fan, is that you have a massive Elvis Presley collection, <laughs> I understand. <laughs> You're a big and, fan of Elvis, are you? Oh, sh sh totally. Wow. And, um, and what's interesting about that is both he and his daughter died from mm. cardiac arrest. Yeah. Um, there's obviously you've always been an Elvis fan, so you didn't know he was going to die of a cardiac arrest. But do you see the um, interesting sort of uh, parallels there with what's I – mean, you're, you're obviously a massive fan. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm a massive fan of – 
I mean, I love Elvis's voice and his singing. What really appealed to me about Elvis when I went to Graceland was how philanthropic he was and how spiritual he was. So it's the stuff about Elvis off stage that fascinated me most about him. So getting to know his story and seeing, you know, walking through Graceland, which is now, well, was his home. It's now a museum, more or less. And you can walk through there and you can feel that connection to him as a person. So that's why I started collecting items to, to put on display here in Australia. So I've got a small museum out at parks. It's, it's quite small and I have scaled back now. I, I, it's not um, something that I'm actively doing anymore because my time is spent on my charity. But that understanding who somebody is behind the scenes, I've just found that so interesting. And yeah, as you say, he, I mean, everybody dies of a cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest means your heart stops beating. Yeah. So everybody's going to die of a cardiac arrest. Eventually. It's what to. causes it yeah. and at what time it happens, right? So when it's unexpected, that's what we call sudden cardiac arrest. That was my cardiac arrest. It was sudden. I didn't know I had heart disease. It wasn't diagnosed. So for my family and my friends, it was like, what the hell? This guy's just dropped dead. They're the type types of cardiac arrests that we're talking about. Now, Elvis, look, there's a lot of talk about what caused his heart attack or cardiac arrest, even Lisa, I don't know. The point is this, when somebody drops in front of you, we need people to understand how to respond to that. And, you know, whatever the journey is in life that you have, whatever your connection is to other people, whether it be a celebrity or, or whatever, we're all the same. We're all human beings. Especially when the heart stops. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that connecting to people through stories and their perceived commonalities in life, um, I think that's a really powerful thing. And, you know, to look back on my life and think that these 20-something-year-olds at the moment are connected to the Wiggles through the music that we created, well, it's an absolute blessing. Well, you, you have lived a life of being a great storyteller and that got you quite a great deal of success. But it seems to me you're still telling a story in relation to, you know, you're telling your personal story now about how to save people. And, um, you know, you talk about Elvis being spiritual and, you know, and you know, having the sort of ethical views in the, th the sorts of people he helped. Yeah. And uh, to be honest with you, like uh, I never expected our conversation to end up there with you because you're doing exactly the same. You're pretty much uh, expressing your own spirituality to all of us yeah. and, and you're still doing it. Yeah. Um, you're still a wiggle and you're, <laughs> and you're still um, looking after. Now you're not talking to kids so much under fives, but you're now talking to those kids who were under five now in their 20s. Yeah. And you're sort of saying to them, hey, guys, just think about your health and think about, you know, how you can help somebody else yeah. and, and remember the yellow wiggle and uh, put a yellow sign on on the front of a window or a shop front or wherever it is where there is an AED to make sure that you can help someone. And I think that's that's still magic, mate. You're still doing the magic. Yeah, thanks, Mark. No, I appreciate it, mate. I know. I appreciate this. This has been unreal. Thank, Thank you. you.